All right, all right. Welcome to Savvy Savage Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest tonight is Nico House. He is the host of the MCSC Network. Welcome back, Nico. It's been a minute. It has, it has. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. All right, so Nico, recently uh, you had an interesting trip. I want to pull up a tweet that you had uh, about your trip in Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, before I pull up that tweet, can you explain to everyone, uh, how did you get the invitation to go to Egypt in the first place? How did all of this begin? So it was actually a Palestinian-ran organization that reached out to me and several other content creators. Uh, the content creators are primarily popular on Instagram and TikTok. So if, if, you, that, if you follow me there, you know, I post a lot on Instagram, especially about Israel and Palestine. A bunch of my videos went viral there. So they found me and asked me if I would be willing to travel to, to help package aid, send aid there, visit some of the orphans there, spend time with them, uh, and, and, and use the opportunity to bring awareness to what's going on uh, what they, and what the organization is doing to help alleviate some of the circumstances that those and guys are dealing with. Awesome. So you tweeted this out. I want to show everyone. You said, I had the great honor of joining several other content creators in Egypt to send aid to Gaza and spend some time with those whose lives have been ravaged by war. We were there for the victims of Palestine, but you'd never believe what my biggest takeaway was. So instead of playing that video, I want to hear directly from you. First and foremost, like, what was the sentiment from people in Egypt in reference to the Palestinian, you know, struggle, what they're going through right now in Gaza? What was the sentiment from people in Egypt on the ground? Uh, very sympathetic, actually. And I would make an argument that they were like frustrated with the Egyptian government for not doing more in order to help the Palestinian people in Gaza. Um, however, there isn't, they're not only crossing through the, the Rafah crossing, there are other areas that they've been able to cross through that are less packed, but it's more risky um, because they're not considered quote unquote safe zones if there is even a safe zone in Gaza. But um so the, the refugees that we worked with, they didn't go, come through the Hoffa border. They came through, or the Rafa border. They came through actually other areas. So uh, they, but they, they generally want to see their government help. But um, like I said in the tweet, what I saw was that the reality of the situation is the government doesn't have the resources to take on that many more refugees in Massey. And it's not necessarily because of the Palestine aspect. But um, like I, we spent time with orphans um, at a school that was primarily, and the school was primarily made up of Syrians and it was based in the Syrian neighborhood. Um, the school had a few hundred. The neighborhood itself was made up of a, about a thousand or so. And I was curious because it was like, the school was made up of Iraqi, Syrians, uh, and Egyptians, but mostly Syrians. And I was like, hold on, why are, why is there a big neighborhood of Syrians here? I had no idea that this was happening. And they were like, oh, well, you know, they're refugees from the war. I was like, that's weird. No one ever talks about the fact that Syrians are out here settling in Egypt. And then I found out there's a huge Somalian and Sudanese community out there. Uh, and it's in a separate area, there is a big uh, Iraqi refugee community as well. So you basically end up figuring out, if you talk to enough people, that the U.S. and in a lot of, a lot of cases, Israel, are ravaging through these countries and the victims that survive, Egypt ends up having to take the brunt of the responsibility to provide some type of refuge for them. Uh, and in my opinion, it's probably in exchange, maybe not a lot of money, but it's they, they, the U.S. helps them out, quote unquote. So they won't talk about just how many refugees Egypt has to take in, just, um, you know, like from all over, specifically because of the, the imperialism of the West. So that was the first time I heard there were Syrian refugees in Egypt. I was surprised when I saw your video. I was like, really? Like you said, mm -hmm. no one's talking about that. And then also that's interesting to hear, Nico, because as you know, some people have the narrative. They've been saying that none of these other countries want to take the Palestinians in. How, why is that? You know, you heard that narrative from Ron DeSantis, mm -hmm. but that says something about Egypt. It's not that they don't want to take them in. They just don't have the resources to take in that many people. They, they don't. Um, they really don't. 
the dollar there is worth a lot of money. Uh, and the unfortunate reality of that me of that is is that means that it, their money doesn't stretch as far. <clears throat> what it takes to buy uh, the purchasing power there isn't as prominent as the the majority of Western nations. And uh, yeah, the government may be receiving a little bit of money from the U.S. to take on these problems, but you're talking about in this particular case, it would be up to 2.5 million. That's the deal that Israel was trying to cut with uh, with Egypt. And the, the truth is, I don't know where they would go, right? The the They have really nice parts of Cairo, but it's pro- most of you probably already know, there's also a lot of really not nice areas because it's not, it's, uh, it's a little bit past developing. It's not a developing nation, but it's, there's parts of developing, but then there's a place that I went to called New Cairo, which is super nice. I actually, the restaurant that I ate at was a Syrian restaurant. Really nice, really fancy. But that's not the majority of Egypt. Um, these and let's like let's not forget that it's not like Palestinians want to leave. So there's that. But right. right now, I feel like there's this this sentiment from the Egyptian government that they feel like they're being bullied again into taking on the responsibility of this genocide that Israel is committing. Um, and that's why I'm sure people have heard rumors that Egypt is like charging Israel in the U.S like $3,000 per Palestinian if they decide to let them in. They keep going up on that number. Um, but it's probably because it's not it has nothing to do with the Palestinians themselves, but they're like, bro, what? how much of this shit do y'all want us to take? Right. Like, it's not fair to that government. It's not fair to the Palestinian people either. Um, and that's why whenever we have that conversation about, oh, why won't other people take them? It's not their responsibility to deal with the problems created by the U.S. and Israel. That's right. Right. Like whenever it's a different conversation that we're having a conversation about undocumented immigrants here in the U.S., most of the problems that have caused them to migrate to the U.S. were caused by the United States. So there is a level of responsibility that you have to have. Um, But that's not the case in Egypt. Egypt isn't participating in the genocide in Gaza. So why should they have to bear the brunt of the responsibility? And then you have. The, the, these these politicians that have the audacity to say, well, why doesn't Egypt take them? They're Arab too. Mm-hmm. Like that's the most racist, ignorant, xenophobic shit I've ever heard. Just because somebody is Arab doesn't mean they have the exact same culture. There's you know there's different dialects of Arabic that they speak. Right. They all understand each other when they want to. You know they have their own culture. They have their own practices, and um, no one wants to be forced to live in another nation because regardless of how accepting they may be, you are still viewed as different. At the end of the day, right. that's why the Syrians have their own community. That's why the Iraqis and the Sudanese have their own communities. So um, it, it's very frustrating that the brunt of the responsibility is being put. I mean, imagine, I mean, it's, isn't it It's the same sentiment of like whenever we complain about something that happens in the U.S. And you're like, well, go back to Africa with your people. Why? Right. Why are those my people? Y'all both black, ain't you? What? Well, we, we have nothing in common. You know, outside of that, at you know, for in and but they're but Egypt is having the blame kind of thrown on them for not wanting their country further destabilized by taking refugees that they honestly cannot handle, and like that's just the the uh, the, the sad reality of it. I also want people to understand it's not easy being a refugee. I know, like when I lived in Germany, and, and Kim Iverson has talked about this as well, like her experience, you know, being a refugee in the United States. But when I lived in Germany, there were actually refugees from Turkey in Hanau, Germany. And I want people to understand it's not that like when they're refugees, they're just living among the general population. The Turkish refugees in Germany lived in ghettos. Mm -hmm. They called them the Turkish ghettos. And it was really it was really slummy. Like, I'm, I'm not even kidding. Like. It's not like they had the same amenities as us. I remember seeing like there were clotheslines like outside of like, they were basically kind of just shoved in uh, to a a pretty dense area. And they had like the clotheslines outside where they had to hang their clothes. So obviously they didn't have like a washer and dryer like the rest of us did and things like that. Like it was, and people were like, stay away from them. And I remember seeing uh, Turkish refugees. It was a little boy. I'll never forget this. A little boy around my age. I remember seeing him going through the trash to get food. So Mm. I want people to understand like, it's not easy being a refugee. You are in someone else's country and 
you got to think about the reasons why you are there and how people are going to yeah. look at you when they see that you're a refugee, because some countries actually see that in a negative way. Yeah. You know, a lot of people think that refugees, so in America, they view refugees as like the Cuban refugees, quote unquote, uh, like the ones that come to America and start businesses, the yeah. ones that come to America, they have their family. The, if in America, I would say 90 to 90 percent, 95 percent of the time, if America accepts ref, a political refugee, they're not actually refugees. They're just friends of the regime that America had installed that had pre that had just got overthrown. Um, for example, with Fidel Castro, he de desegregated and, and threw out the trash. That's why the majority of the Cubans in Miami are white and, and wealthy, and they got grants and business loans and all kinds of shit that you ain't never heard of. Cubans are the wealthiest Latino group in the world, literally. This is not hyperbole. They're the wealthiest Latino group in the world, uh, American Cubans specifically, but the, my, the majority of Cubans in Cuba are black, right? The majority of Venezuelans you'll see in the U.S., um, are white and pretty well off, and the, but the majority of Venezuelans actually are mestizo or indigenous or black. Uh, same thing with Colombia. So like, it's a pattern that you see over and over and over again, where you see refugees in the U.S. and they're doing well for themselves. So other people think like, oh, that's the norm. That's not the norm for the rest of the world. Refugees are struggling. Actual, real refugees that have had their lives ravaged by war. Um, I mean, they're orphans. They have one, you know, one or two siblings, but it's just them, and they're just hoping that someone uh, is just takes takes them in and 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 treats them well, and they're at the will of other people's goodwill, and that's the reality. in the in the governments that they live in, and it's it's not pretty, yo. Like the 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 situations that we see in the U.S. are the exception a lot of the time, most of the time, I would say it's 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 basically the exception. That's what I really learned, and when you see it. For yourself in person, it's sad. It was a little bit overwhelming. I had to step away a couple of times because you're seeing these 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 uh, orphans that like, you know they have the biggest smiles on their face. They're in school, you know, uh, learning the same way that we learn, and they're doing all the little fun activities and stuff like that. We actually went outside and played with them. It was it was pretty dope. It was actually a good time. But like the backdrop of that is is like when I got got out of school, I went home to my mom and my brother. Uh, they're, uh, the majority of them were not going home to their parents. The majority of them were not going home to a television and video games and they knew they were going to have food in the refrigerator, um, going home to new clean clothes. They're wearing something, uh, you know, a new outfit every, every day of the week. Sometimes they're wearing the same outfit three or four times that week. Um, some of them are getting out of school to go work in the street to sell candy or sell whatever they can. Um, and, and, and some of them, if they disappear, no one's going to, they have nobody that's looking for them. Like, that's what they're dealing with after, after they get out of school. And this was, like I said, this is a school of 200, 300 refugees. Um, we were fortunate enough to sponsor them to make sure they had all the supplies they need and the teachers were well paid up to the next year. But it's, it, it's sad, yo. What, what, the consequences of our wars just don't get discussed enough. And it, one of the, it frustrated me, Savvy, when I'm watching these videos of these fucking, liberals in New York, Zionist liberals in New York, uh, we're, we're just trying to be brave. We're just, uh, we're so strong. Jewish, we're just strong together. Like, bro, you're not going through shit. There's nothing wrong with your life. And you're like, like acting like you were there. First of all, half of them act like they were there on October 7th. They weren't. Half of them act like they would fight. If that land was really, like, I know what it looks like whenever you're willing to fight for yours in your land. You know why? Because the Palestinians, they're refusing to leave, although it's a guarantee they'll die. Guess what happened the other day whenever they heard a few alarms go off in Israel? 30,000, gone. 30,000 people up and left. But, but this <laughs> land, they're, they're, they're willing to kill women and children and say that it's theirs, but they're not willing to even stay there if there's a threat, if there's a possibility of a threat to their own lives. It's not your fucking land. You can go back to wherever the hell you came from because it'll never yours and you know it. You're just a tourist that's willing to kill other people for your tourism. That's effectively what you are, whether or not you live there long term or not. So yeah. when I hear that, these people on Twitter acting like they're fucking victims, when you have orphans that are that that, you know, hopefully they have a chance 
at having a decent life. And it's not because of anything that they did wrong. It's because of powers from overseas, uh, powers that they will never meet, have any influence of over, have no, no ability to vote for, are ravaging their lives for God knows what reason. And, and everybody's just cool with it. Because they don't have to see it, you know, they don't have to see it in person. They get on Twitter, they'll refute any of the any of the views that they see. Oh, that's just propaganda. That's not, that's not fucking propaganda. That's and, and what you see on Twitter is the is the least offensive shit that you could possibly see. I've seen worse. Do you think in reference to Egypt, is there was there any sense of fear that you heard from them? Uh, when you were there, whether or not this would end up in their backyard, I'm in reference to like, if you don't take the Palestinian people and let them come in, is there any fear in reference to that? Whether Israel is going to start to push back on them? No, no, because like, to be frank, uh, Egyptians in general are just tired of Israel's shit, right? They're tired of their shit. And unfortunately, I feel like the, the Palestinians have kind of been caught in the middle of being tired of their shit because like, Otherwise, they would be. They have opened their borders to Palestinians in the past, so it's not like that's not a new phenomena. But just the way the audacity of Israel to create this whole plan to displace uh, millions of Palestinians and just like, yeah, man, Egypt, you got it. Like, where do y'all getting this idea from? And where Israel's getting the idea is like, well, you know, you're the U.S.'s bitch, so you're gonna do what we tell you to do. That's that's how. The, and e Egypt is not in the minority of being tired of Israel in the U.S.'s shit, as we've seen over the last several weeks. So they don't have really any fear. And I just feel like that's just a, a constant that we're seeing across the board where the world, um, uh, outside of those governments that are obviously going to be loyal to Israel, um, at least when it comes to sending aid but like and, and paying lip service, but the rest of the world is tired of their shit. Even Saudi Arabia has told the US they need to chill out with attacking the Houthis and attacking Yemen. Saudi Arabia has not backed anything that's been happening in Gaza. Putin has spoken out about the situation in Gaza. Um, the the there's a lot of mainstream talking heads that are flipping on that issue, and they were wrong in the beginning. So like everybody is kind of tired of Israel shit. In Egypt, they don't feel really any fear right now because what are they going to do? Like what 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 can anyone do? The U.S. is overextended. Nobody fears Biden, and and Yahoo doesn't even have the support of his own people. So why why would they have to fear him? It is, it's very interesting. And if we go back to, we think about Russia and Ukraine, remember some of the same people like Ron DeSantis who said, none of these other countries want to take the Palestinians in. Notice when it came to the Ukrainians, there was not that same rhetoric. The United mm -hmm. States government was like, come on over here. I don't know if people know this, but JB and I covered this, uh, I think it was last year that actually Hampton University, which is an HBCU, they actually were giving free room and board and tuition to Ukrainian refugees that were fleeing Ukraine because of the war. They won't even give that to black students that go to the HBCU. That's so sure. notice, <laughs> notice the difference though, when it's Europeans, you don't hear them make that same comment. Well, what did they say? Uh, what, what did that news lady say? She was like, you know, they're women and children with white, blonde hair and blue eyes that look like Europeans. Isn't that what they said? Like, that's why, right? When it's, it's just the, the part of a larger sentiment that we've seen uh, permeating throughout the mentality of the West, which is the victims only matter when they're white. Like, that, I, I hate to be so blunt about it. Um, we, we know what's happening right now in the Congo. We know as what what's been happening all over Africa, really, but in, in the Congo, um, in in Sudan, in Somalia, and this isn't and in, 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 yeah, you know why people have started talking about it because they've actually tried to use it to deflect away from what's happening in Gaza. They're like, have you guys been talking about this? We're like, yeah, we've been talking about this shit for years. What are you talking about? And ironically, Israel is part of the reason this situation in the Congo was happening. That's right. They're literally that, so like, but so they want to use it to deflect. And that's, and that's usually the only time that black issues get brought up in, in regards to Africa or really in the States even. It's always to deflect away from the reality that our lives are don't hold the same value. And I mean, I, yeah, they, they do, technically speaking, but politically speaking, no. Right. If they can't win somebody an election. You're no, right. They don't care. Um, You're right. Yeah. It's, it's sad, yo. It, and that's not and it's not it's not like. 
that's exclusively the white politicians. Black politicians treat our lives the same way. There you go. <laughs> like, there you go. It, it's heartbreaking. It's it's truly heart. I mean, could you imagine? Um, for example, Gaddafi, if he was the leader of the European Union and just got fucking just just, just they went up in his country and assassinated him because they didn't like his policies. Could you no, no one could ever imagine something like that happen. Because he was just the, the chairman of the African Union. That's different. If it was a European Union, no, because those are civilized people. These people have the audacity to call Muslims and Arabs and Africans. They just don't know how to govern. Well, who the hell is a part going across the world to blow shit up, paying terrorists to blow shit up, starting wars that you should have never started? And then when hundreds of thousands to millions of Arabs get killed, you're like, mm, our bad. Sorry, we got the wrong guy. The only way that that's allowed to happen is if society is collectively decided. Yeah, those lives don't matter as much, so it's cool. It's really interesting. Where do you think Saudi Arabia fits into all of this? Because Saudi Arabia is interesting considering the fact that they are joining BRICS, right? So they're, they have yeah. their comrades with Russia and China, but they're also supposed to be an ally of the United States. Supposed to be, yeah. Um, I think that Saudi Arabia is actually a key player in all this. And we can talk about, for example, the situation with the war in Ukraine. The U.S. tried to use Saudi Arabia to flex on Russia. Didn't work. Russia was like, or excuse me, Ukraine. Was, no, not Ukraine. My apologies. Saudi Arabia was like, mm, nah, we're good. We're going to stay out of this, homie. Y'all got it, though. We'll wait for you. Let us know how it goes. <laughs> Which no one was really expecting. Um, although people should have expected it because what people don't really discuss with the assassination of Soleimani was the fact that Soleimani was on mission to represent Iran and along with, uh, and he was going to work with Iraq. He was meeting with Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia and Iran were creating a peace deal specifically involving their oil. That is why they assassinated Soleimani. And that wasn't the first time that they had met. So like Saudi Arabia, they're not stupid. They know if y'all have control over all of the oil in the Middle East and y'all finally get control over Iran, the only, only thing worse than being an enemy of the U.S. is being an ally of the U.S. And we would be your only competition left. Yeah, screw that. So we're going to get ahead of this shit and we're going to partner up with who we have to partner up with, which is why Saudi Arabia went from representing our interests in Yemen, what people got to remember. Why, why would Yemen be so damn important to the United States? We're finding out right now because of the Red Sea, yep. because the Houthis are managing to stop Every and anything that comes through right now. And it's just the Houthis. They don't even have all the help that they could and would have. And in, in spite of the Houthis actively working against the U.S. and against Israel in this particular situation, Saudi Arabia is in the middle of peace deals with the Houthis right now. Because there's a, the Yemeni government right now, the official quote unquote Yemeni government is Saudi back. And they're working with the Houthis. On a peace deal that the U.S. is trying to sabotage, but Saudi Arabia came out and was like, "No, y'all better chill the hell out with this with bombing Yemen and shit. Y'all got to stop." So we're finding like, so if, if they're not getting involved with this, because Saudi Arabia is there, and if why did think about it like this? Why did the U.S. have to bomb Yemen? Why didn't Saudi Arabia do it? So we've been what have we been doing in the past? Giving the weapon to Saudi Arabia and letting them handle the situation in Yemen. Giving the weapon, that's what, remember Trump vetoed that bill. That's right. It's not arming them. So why all of a sudden do we have to get directly involved? Because Saudi Arabia is like, yeah, we ain't playing this game with y'all anymore. Yeah. Is, we, we, y'all are out of control. This, the shit is, 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 so with all of that happening in the background, Saudi Arabia, they're, we, we can make an argument they're being neutral, but you can even make an argument that they're kind of being offensive through their neutrality because they know, like, y'all need us to be involved for y'all to be successful. And that's including Israel, by the way. That's including Israel. Israel uses terrorist organizations to, to infiltrate governments and cause problems in the Middle East in the, uh, in the same way that the U.S. uses Saudi Arabia to do so. So if Saudi Arabia doesn't get involved, I, that's, that's why I predicted, I'm predicting that Israel is going to be invaded. I would give it about a year. They don't have anybody left. Like that's it's they're They've overplayed their hand. I believe that the Ukraine war is going to be over very shortly. 
Um, but Netanyahu d- is not popular anymore. They're oh. losing way more casualties with this war with Gaza than they were expecting. Netanyahu uh, is, is the people can't like outside of his house. The victims of these families are pissed. The I don't believe that. You think that everybody be going to everybody about to be going to birthright this year or next couple of years? You think everybody be signing up for the IDF just for that that uh, dual citizen? Nope, that shit's over. Like don't y'all know? Don't believe everything y'all see on TikTok. People they, they're scared. They Israel's never had to fight a war before. Israel's been able to bully women and children. But the moment that these people try to fight against Hamas with the ones they had to see each other face to face, hasn't been working out well, has it? So. Y'all finally, they might think they, uh, they have uh, achieved some type of goal, some type of victory with the situation in Gaza, but they're going to be exhausted from it. And Lebanon and Syria and Yemen and Iran and Iraq with a Saudi Arabia who's like, yeah, we're just going to sit back and see what happens. And Russia, who has made it very clear that denazifying the world is at the top of their agenda. And they didn't say that that was going to stop at Ukraine. What do y'all think is going to happen whenever the world has... Because the world is collectively looking... With the, with the ICJ's ruling too, with more cases coming to fruition, the world, everyone who has beef with Israel has been given a green light. And guess what they found out with the war in Ukraine? The U.S. can't do shit about it. <laughs> the U.S. can't do a damn thing because y'all just watch Russia ravage Ukraine, and y'all sat there and watched it happen. Y'all watched the coup happen in Niger, talked all that shit, like y'all was going to do something, didn't do a goddamn thing. NATO is teeth, they're, te- they're teethless now. So, we're tired of y'all shit. And we know that you don't even have the morale in your own country to fight us off, and we also know that the majority of Americans don't want anything to do with this war. So they're not about to join to help y'all do shit. If anything, they might join to help to help uh, uh, the, uh, the other countries take down Israel. They're, the world is tired of Israel's shit, and they might have overplayed their hand this time. So in reference to Egypt, could it also be, Nico, that Egypt knows what Israel's trying to do um, other than the resources? Could it also be that Israel knows that Israel is trying to push the Palestinian people out and that if they did, let's say they did have the resources and they allowed the Palestinians from Gaza to come in, could it be that Egypt knows that Israel will try to prevent them from coming back home? Yeah, they know. I mean, no, they're, they, I'm 100% positive that's why. I mean, their plan that they outlawed through their intelligence support was very clear. They don't want them to come back, right? That's like, especially because they had natural gas that's in Gaza that they're supposed to sell to uh, the EU. And actually, Egypt was supposed to take part in that. But I don't think that they don't, I don't think Egypt has any faith that this is going to go down the way Israel is expecting it to. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think that's a big part of it. I also think that uh, Egypt is, um, they also know that if, if they give right now, you think that, uh, look at what's happening right now with the, with the border. Egypt is trying to get supplies through their border into Gaza or into the, through the Rafa, Rafa border into Gaza and, and Israel is blocking their borders. Yeah. So like this, it's just the audacity, right? So y'all, do you, does anyone think that if Israel stops with Gaza or excuse me, if that they take over Gaza, they're going to stop at Gaza, that Israel is not, or that Egypt is not a potential uh, threat to lose land, like to lose their own land to, to Israel? Because that's how Israel's acting. Like they can take whatever the fuck they want to. Like Israel literally has a, a, a greater Israel plan. They've made it very, very, it's parts of Lebanon, parts of Syria, parts of Iran, parts of Iraq. It's massive where they believe Israel is. And Egypt is a part of that. And if Israel, Egypt continues to acquiesce and acquiesce and acquiesce, eventually. Israel's going to be like, yeah, we can take that shit. They're not going to do anything about it. So yeah. I just feel like, I feel like it's a, I feel no one feels like they are protected by the U S even the puppets that were puppets reluctantly like Egypt. You got to think about it like this. Why would Israel make this dumb? The, the, what they're doing right now is stupid. It's I know they've killed 30,000 people. That's horrific. There's 2.5 million Palestinians and you've been doing everything in your power to kill them. And you've killed 30,000, but y'all have lost thousands of yourself and even more so you've lost the propaganda war so like 
this shit ain't gonna fly for much longer. So what happens next? It's like you were desperate. What made you so desperate to make a move like this? Maybe it's because you realize that the only way you've been able to get away with all of this is because your big brother's been protecting you. But if no one respects the power of your big brother and you see that influence militarily and economically beginning to dissipate in front of your eyes, the only way you're going to be able to even have a chance to achieve this goal of greater Israel is if you strike now. So it's a sign really that even Israel is beginning to realize, shit, we got to take advantage of the situation now because we don't know what's going to happen three or four years because this war in Ukraine really showed the world, the US, the empire is done. Um, you know, they're holding on by a string, but the reality is the empire can no longer protect its allies and give them the advantage that they once did. And also, I think it proved that like it, uh, uh, Putin is a genius. He's, a, he's really smart and he's one of the ones that is heading this new multipolar world that we're living in. And the behavior of Israel, at least from what we've seen, the way Putin handled Ukraine will not be tolerated. And we've seen how Russia has defended Syria, has defended Iraq, uh, will defend, even though they don't need it, Iran. So do you think that in a new multipolar world where like a Russia and a China are in charge, that Israel will be able to get away with this bullshit still? Of course not. So they have to take what they can now because they ain't, they ain't going to be able to take it after this is all said and done. Well... I want to, I do want to show this video clip because I do want people to see this. I changed my mind, Nico. Sorry. Uh, this yeah. is Nico, <laughs> Nico in Egypt. And then I want to ask you about hotspot really quick, Nico, because a lot mm -hmm. of people are like, what is hotspot? So I just want to play part of this at least. All right, guys. So I had this incredible opportunity recently. I was able to go to Egypt with several other content creators and help the all of my international charity package and send aid over to Gaza. Honestly, it was like an opportunity of a lifetime. Now, originally, I was only expecting to interact with some of the Palestinian refugees, some of which, by the way, helped put this organization together. And of course, we were able to interact with some of the Palestinian refugees, some from the organization and some who were just hanging out on the street. We were also fortunate enough to get the opportunity to visit a school, a school that primarily housed and taught Syrian refugees. Now, these refugees are also orphans and they weren't totally Syrian, there were some Iraqis sprinkled in there and also some Egyptians sprinkled in there as well, but I was confused. See, as we were outside playing and gallivanting and having the time of our lives, I couldn't help but pause and think to myself, so we just got done interacting with Palestinian refugees and we're packaging aid to send to Gaza. Right now we're hanging out with some Syrian orphans. Uh, why, why? Why are they here? Because not only was this a Syrian school, it was in a totally Syrian neighborhood. Then it also made me think about the situation in Gaza, how many people are basically asking Egypt to take on 2.5 million, more or less, refugees from Palestine, in addition to all of the other refugees that Egypt already has. But it's not just Syrian refugees. There's 200,000 Sudanese, 153,000 Syrians, 37, 38,000 South Sudanese, 32,000 Eritreans, 17,000 Ethiopians, 8,000 Yemenis. Do you see where I'm going here? And I don't know if you notice, but every single one of those countries that I just named, the United States and or Israel has been involved with destabilizing that nation. So let me just say, first of all, I can't actually blame Egypt for not wanting to take wholesale 2.5 million Palestinians, not that they would want to leave anyway, but they don't have the resources. Yeah, they're a lot further along than most countries, especially most developing countries, but they don't have the resources to continue to take the brunt of the responsibility for all the problems that the United States and Israel are causing. And also, it's the United States, its allies, and Israel causing this refugee crisis that so many people around the world are complaining about in their own nations. Now, being an American, I usually get to experience refugees who have managed to thrive despite their unfortunate circumstances that were caused by their lives being destroyed by the United States invading their country. But in Egypt, I saw the other side, which are the refugees that didn't get to make it to the States. The kids 
who lost both of their parents and the majority of their family. And therefore, they're having to start everything from scratch and are hoping that someone is kind enough and willing enough to help them build. Basically, I learned those who make it to the US and manage to thrive, that's the exception. What I saw was the norm. What I witnessed were the consequences of vicious and unchecked, unaccountable Western imperialism, sprinkled with a little empathy from those who are willing to help those victims. What I witnessed was a world where everyone else has to deal with the consequences of that unchecked U.S. imperialism. And what I'm wondering is, when is it going to be enough? And when are people going to stand up and say, we're not taking this shit anymore? That was excellent, Nico. And, and really quick, I noticed you mentioned the country Sudan. Uh, that's another one where people are saying there's a possible proxy war. And I want you to tell everyone a little bit about Hotspot. Yeah, uh, so Hotspot, we basically do short videos to, to talk about like very complex issues in a way that's kind of like introductory. We do like deep dives, but like it's a way that's introductory to the topic uh, so that people know about things that a lot of times aren't being talked about. We talk about trending topics too, but we go into the, into the details that a lot of people don't really discuss. Nick uh, from RBN is also part of the Hotspot team. Uh, and it's, it's actually been pretty dope. Like I've, I, I like doing those short videos. One, it's great for ADHD, but two, <laughs> but two, it gives me the opportunity to cover a lot of topics in the course of a week that otherwise I wouldn't be able to talk about on my show for whatever reason. Cause I don't ever necessarily get to talk about every hot pot, hot spot topic on my show. Uh, but also there are topics that I might start with a hotspot video, but then I can actually delve deeper into on my show, you know, after I gauge how interested people are in the topic. So it's, it's been pretty dope. I'm, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity. That is awesome, Nico. And then are they, can you tell us like with hotspot, are they also on TikTok or is this? Yeah. Is it, okay. TikTok, sure. Instagram. Yeah. TikTok. I think they have like, we have like 200,000, 200,000 plus on TikTok. And like a hundred thousand or so on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, Twitter was actually my baby. Like they wanted to see if they could implement uh, a similar strategy for Twitter. And I was like, yeah, it, it, you can't really do it the same way as TikTok and Instagram. Cause like the algorithm is different and you actually gotta be able to talk about some shit. Like the stuff that you talk about has to be relevant because people on Twitter, they're only going to watch if they care. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I just saw a very unique opportunity because we do viral videos, viral content, all that good stuff. But it's, I was like, we have a really unique opportunity to actually bring attention to really important topics that otherwise probably wouldn't be discussed. And I just saw a window with um, a lot of people kind of sticking to Instagram and TikTok with the shorter videos. I was like, well, nobody's really doing it for, uh, for Twitter. You know, if they might take a video that they saw go viral on TikTok, uh, and Instagram, but it's not necessarily tailored to an audience for Twitter, right? And there's a difference. And yes. so um, we we were able to take advantage of it. And and Nick has been tremendous. Our editors have been tremendous, and we we've really been able to kind of dig into this niche. So like I said we're very fortunate at the success we were able to have over the last year. You guys have been killing it. Like sometimes people just want two minute, three minute news very quickly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the editors make it so like half the time when I go back and look at the video, I'm like, shit, I did this. I don't remember it being this interesting when I recorded it, you know. <laughs> but they do such a good job, man. So, like I said, it's it's kind of like been a match made in heaven, and we're all on the same page, uh, and we all know what the what the what the audience want, but we also understand like the message and the feeling and the sense of urgency that we want to convey. And so it's like just kind of been like a perfect match so far. Awesome. All right, Nico, where can people find you? I'm still on YouTube, guys. At, uh, you can look me up at, you can type in For the People Podcast, or you can just look my name up, Nico House. Obviously, I'm on Twitter on at Real Nico House, and you can also follow Hotspot at Hotspot, Hotspot, all one word, two times. Um, on Instagram at Real Nico House, on uh, TikTok as well at Real Nico House. Awesome. Nico, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Ab. Bye.